Buongiorno a tutti, benvenuti all'ultimo webinar di quest'anno. Oggi chiudiamo in bellezza insieme agli esperti HD moderati dal nostro Marco Terzago, un Rubble Member. Nell'incontro di oggi, che si svolgerà interamente in lingua inglese, vi ricordo, parleremo di CatNAP e rischi climatici. Senza dilungarmi oltre, vi presento con piacere i relatori. Mattias Tian, Risk Analyst Natural Hazard HD Global C. Welcome. Fabrizio Di Tirro, Risk Consulting Energy and International Incoming Manager HD Global C, rappresentanza generale per l'Italia. Benvenuto. Vi ricordo che alla fine di questo webinar potrete effettuare il test valido ai fini RUIVAS, vi invieremo subito via mail le istruzioni, ve le proietto alla fine e le scrivo anche in chat. Aspettiamo tutte le vostre domande come sempre, per qualsiasi necessità sono in regia. Eh, lascio la parola a Marco Tezzago. Welcome everybody, thank you. Ok, thank you very much Angelica and uh, buongiorno a tutti, good morning everybody, good morning for uh, our uh, German friends that uh, I believe are quite a few. Uh, I'm very glad to uh, introduce uh, this, uh, this webinar. webinar. Uh, I mean, needless to say, uh, weather related events are more extreme, frequent and devastating, especially here in Italy. Uh, we have had this year, it, it was a, a horrible year for, uh, for Italy. Uh, I can mention, of course, the uh, uh, devastating impact of the flood and the, and the extreme weather events that we have had in the Emilia-Romagna region in, uh, in May and more recently in the, in the event that have hit Tuscany and Liguria. Uh, so, even looking at the future, there is no reason to be optimistic. Uh, the provisional model uh, estimates in the next years a significant increase in the frequency and the, and the intensity of this uh, weather-related event and phenomena, uh, increasing, uh, once again, the level of uncertainty. According to the Consiglio Nazionale delle Ricerche, CNR, Uh, in the last decades, the net cut in Italy have caused damages for even more than 310 billion euros. And even reading the recent data that ANIA, the Confederation of All the Insurers, uh, have in business in Italy, uh, you will discover that in 2023, in this year, we already had 122 extreme events And, uh, you know, the, the data that is amazing, uh, everyone, I mean, especially not Italians, is that just only 5% of the houses and 7%, only 7% of corporations have an insurance policy to finance, uh, you know, uh, the results of these uh, catastrophes. As always happens in our country unfortunately the awareness on this subject increases only when it is uh, you know in the emergency phase uh, and uh, of course the uh, awareness on uh, what risk management action we have to to do we have to take of course will it's now high time to impose uh, some uh, new uh, regulation and sanctions. Uh, so it will happen if no modification will, uh, will be introduced with the introduction of the Article 24 that is called Misure in Materia di Rischi Catastrofali, so risk management measures in terms of NATCAT. That is in draft in the in the new financial law for 2024. That it will be discussed, uh, you know, in the next few weeks before the end of this year. This regulation will introduce the uh, the mandatory obligation for all the corporation to stipulate an insurance policy to cover the damage that will be uh, directly caused by NetCat. Uh, that will will happen in the in the Italy Italian uh, territory um, the insurance of course uh, will uh, will will have to take care about the uh, direct uh, losses on the assets and of course the uh, the comma 2 
of this uh, of this regulation will foresee that uh, of course uh, this insurance obligation will have to be considered uh, in all cases of uh, uh, you know need to have some financial um, you know provision from uh, from the government even in the occasion if even additional provision of uh, financial help from the state even in case of this uh, net cut event and of course there will be also sanctions so fines uh, for uh, all insurers uh, in case of uh, violation or illusion of this obligation to uh, to stipulate uh, policies including renewals of course ivas the istituto di vigilanza sulle assicurazioni private so the 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 authority for regulating uh, insurers uh, can uh, you know uh, sanction insurance companies uh, not uh, fulfilling this obligation to stipulate or to renew uh, from a minimum of 200,000 euros up to a maximum of 1 million euros of course this is not uh, normally a right way to uh, to introduce awareness I mean, awareness should be introduced by facts and figures. And this is what we will talk about. I'm sure my friends, Matthias and Fabrizio, we will talk, will talk about facts and figures. Nevertheless, I think that uh, this is surely an opportunity to create culture in a, in a forced way, we can say, and uh, increase the comprehension of a correct, uh, you know, uh, management of the assets in relation uh, the assets of a corporation in relation to this risk it's a first step that we of course as a risk management uh, community uh, participant uh, we we welcome very much with satisfaction because it represents the start of a, of a path that we we hope will be a virtual a virtuous path uh, this is at least what i what i uh, hope and in the future, will involve, I hope, not only corporations, but also all other, uh, sub, uh, all other uh, stakeholders, including uh, civil uh, uh, houses and so on. So this is just to introduce the the, the topic uh, with particular, uh, you know, focus on uh, on Italy. So let's talk about fact and figures. And uh, I am uh, have the pleasure to leave the word uh, to Matthias Jan to start with uh, with the fact and figures. Please, Matthias. Good morning, everyone, from my side. So may I first of all ask to mute the microphones uh, for all of you who haven't already. That would be nice uh, to avoid the echoing. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Matthias, and uh, I'm working for HDI Home Office in Hanover, Germany, as a risk analyst for natural hazards. And um, my first question is, um, do you see my screen already? Yeah, so you see my screen. OK, thanks, Marco. Yeah, before I start, let me say thank you um, to Marco, Angelica, and also Erika from HDI for all the support in preparing um, and organizing this meeting. It's my pleasure uh, to take this opportunity and I'm happy to join. Again, thanks for having me. Um, today, I would like to present the way HDI Global and HDI Risk Consulting deal with NUTCAT exposure and climate risks. However, it will be a general overview of all the services we offer. And um, I'm happy to say that Fabrizio will have his part right after me. So yeah, all I can say now Enjoy. And I think in case of any questions, Marco, you will deal with that. And uh, I think we will, um, okay, right. Thank you. Okay, um, first of all, let me start with a quote. Um, here we go. The signs linking the increased frequency and severity of extreme weather to the climate crisis has matured tremendously in the last couple of years. Indeed. Al Gore, um, he's right. Today, we know quite a lot about climate risks and research gives us more and more information. But it is still difficult to say where climate change, let's say, uh, starts. For example, Marco already mentioned that, but let us have a look in the last years. 
So let's talk about the facts and figures, so to say. Um, the year 2021 was called a year of extremes. The top five events referring to the overall losses were Hurricane Ida, for example, in the US with more than 65 billion US dollars. Storm depression burned, affecting huge parts of Western Europe and summing up of more than uh, 50 billion, 54 billion US dollars. Winter storms in the US again, um, resulting in more than 30 billion US dollars, flooding in China, 60.5 billion US dollars, and an earthquake in Japan, almost 8 billion US dollars. And this is very high figures, right? And uh, I would like to draw your attention to one fact. Um, four losses out of five are related to extreme weather in this um, year, right? Um, 2022 was then called another year of extremes. It is not necessary to read out all the figures of the top five events to you. I think you can read it yourself. But uh, Hurricane Ian, for example, led to immense losses of 100 billion US dollars. And again, four of the five um, of the top five losses refer to weather-related events. And what about this year? Um, there are no figures for the whole year yet, but even in the first half of the year, we had already high losses in the US due to severe weather. We had record temperatures in many regions and very high water temperatures in oceans. Plus, there were droughts in Europe and extreme wildfires in Canada. Weather-related events seem to play an important role, and the, the historic record somehow, how can I say, somehow confirms this feeling, so to say. Let us have a look at the historic record. The development of overall losses in the global market caused by weather-related events is quite impressive. Um, but I guess it's not a surprise for most of you. I think most of you, or a lot of you, are already familiar with these kind of charts. Um, the linear trend is clear losses increase. Um, there are different reasons for this. Back in the 70s, the 80s, and so on, all risk wordings, all risk policies were not standard. Policies covered fire, lightning, explosion, and aircraft. Natural perils um, had to be included and negotiated into the policy, so to, say, so to say, separately. Another reason is also quite simple. The number of clients, and thus the amount of losses, increased due to more people living on the planet compared to the 70s and 80s more clients, more losses, so to say. And kind of crazy, but people seem to love living in exposed areas and not in Northern Germany where I live, which is probably the most boring area in the world when it comes to natural hazards. But I'm quite happy about that. So there are growing urban centers in exposed areas, for example, such as Florida. And um, this also leads to increasing losses. The question is, is this trend also to be explained by climate change? Do we see climate change in this chart? This is, to be honest, this is a difficult question and it's not possible to allocate events <clears throat> of the past clearly to climate change. Of course, as you can see in the chart, there are extraordinary years, for example, like 2005 with hurricanes Katrina, Rita, and Wilma, or 2017 with Harvey, Irma, and Maria. And events like these suggest that climate change is playing its part. And, and uh, this statement is somehow support the uh, Sorry, and this statement is somehow supported by science. As you can see here, according to the latest IPCC report, it is expected that exposures will change, right? Even areas with low exposure may be at high risk in the future. Tropical storms are, among others, mentioned as natural hazards that could worsen. Please remember the first slide saying all the um, tropical cyclones causing high losses. So on the one hand, we have a rising trend regarding overall losses. And on the other hand, we have scientists saying we need to expect even more extreme events to come. So let me put it in my own simple words, so to say, I think we need to be prepared, right? And that's what it's all about. And the UN somehow nicely summarizes it. However, greater action and ambition will be needed to cost effectively manage the risk both now and in the future. And there are two parts in here now and in the future. And this is exactly what I would like to share today, to show today. But uh, first of all, let us start with the now. So the question is, how can a reliable risk assessment be performed? How can the current exposure of the site be determined? As you can see, we do have a lot of hazards which need to be addressed. And risk managers, brokers, clients 
we as HDI want to know what perils are locations exposed to. And here comes our global atlas of natural hazards into play, Argos. What is Argos? It stands for Accumulation Risk Geospatial Online System, which is quite a bit complicated. So uh, I think it's okay to stick to the word Argos, right? Argos is a tool which has been developed in-house and is currently provided to internal users only, but this will change next year. Argos will be available for external users as well. Um, the Argos detailed information on the exposure of locations are provided. We use global hazard maps to identify exposure. Here's an excerpt of the tornado, the tsunami, and the earthquake hazard map. But there are more maps. Let us have a closer look at the global flood map, for example. The flood map in Argos has a global extent. This is true for all of our hazard maps. All of our hazard maps have a global extent. Um, <clears throat> and the flood map considers both river floods as well as floods caused by heavy precipitation, which is quite important these days. Um, data is provided by CutRisk, which is an American company, and based on both a high-resolution terrain model and a climate model for precipitation. For floods, we are able to determine the water heights for six different return periods for each place in the world. Let us have a more detailed look. As you can see, it is quite easy to determine the flood exposure of any point on the map. Water heights are given for each return period, be it 10 years or 500 years, or anything in between. In addition, we come up with a zoning result and a flood score, which is, in this case, 4.07. The score is implemented um, for each of our hazard maps. It is a harmonized system, so to say, of grades between one and six, with one being the lowest and six being the highest exposure. In the case of flood, the score considers all water heights and determines the exposure. The zone, in this case, this is five, gives advice of how often the site is flooded. Five is the highest zone and indicates the site is flooded every 10 years. Let us also look at this site. Um, as you can see, Argos indicates the site will be flooded completely, um, or the risk of flooding uh, is affecting the whole site. Now it is time to talk a bit about weaknesses a model is a model, and uh, as you know, no model is perfect. The site is protected in this case by individual protection measures, um, which is a dam. However, Argos does not seem to consider this. And the question is, how can, what, what can we do in these cases? Um, we always try to deliver as reliable results as possible and do thus check further sources. In this case, protection measures are considered by local maps published especially for that single region. Uh, this guarantees a full and transparent approach. Okay, what else do we have then? Flood. Let us jump to the wind perils. We differentiate between three perils as we believe detailed knowledge about exposure allows to build up resilience with pinpoint accuracy. It is a difference if a site is exposed against an F4 tornado or a cut five hurricane, for example. In the chart, you can see that the different types of wind come along with different scales and, even more important, with different wind speeds. Knowing the site is exposed to high wind, so to say, does not necessarily help. High wind can be a lot of things. And the better we know about the characteristics of an event to come, the better we can define protection measures and recommendations to deal with it. Here we have um, three maps of our wind perils. All three wind perils um, are analyzed individually to keep full transparency for risk managers, brokers, underwriters, and of course, for our clients. As I said, here are three small parts of the hazard maps. They are also covering the whole globe. Um, <clears throat> and as you can see from left to right, it is tornado, tropical storm, and extra tropical storm. Just to give you an idea, and all of these maps refer to a return period of 100 years. Earthquake. Another example is, of course, our hazard map of earthquakes, which provides information about intensities of earthquakes to be expected at a site. Historical events are also shown, and for significant events, we provide detailed footprints, um, which are published by other institutes, for example, the United States State Geological Survey. These footprints show the intensities of the event in different scales. 
Here we have the so-called modified Mercalli intensity, but footprints are also available, for example, in peak ground acceleration to account for more technical background. All in all, using Argos allows to perform a complete risk assessment. Each peril is analyzed individually. Zones describe the intensity of the peril. Hazard scores define the exposure. Once all perils are zoned, users get a first overview, so to say. In this case, there are some perils which indicate <clears throat> high intensity expressed by the zone. In this case, it is namely tropical storm, lightning, and flood. However, once the zoning results are translated into our hazard scores, it comes clear that tropical storms and floods are expected to bear the highest exposure and thus the highest loss potential. The scores allow to easily to compare perils and it is thus easy to see where highest exposure comes from. The hazard scores are finally summarized to the position score, which is a good indicator for the overall exposure of a location. Users get a clear picture of the exposure of a site at a glance, and this can be used to increase resilience. If speaking about resilience, the question is um, how to increase resilience of locations. <clears throat> At first, it is necessary to analyze the exposure and to identify most vulnerable parts of the site. Then, protection measures need to be defined. This is a bit more complex than just determining the exposure, but we as HRC are happy to help with this. Once the risk is reduced, um, the site is more resilient against natural hazards. As I said in the beginning today, it's just about providing a short overview of how HDI and HDI risk consulting assesses the risks. And uh, here are some key takeaways of how we support. For example, we offer desktop analysis to identify the exposure, including loss estimates for expected events if requested. We also assess already existing mitigation measures and come up with recommendations to even improve the situation. If requested, we do <clears throat> more than just desktop analysis and perform site visits to individually consider all risk-influencing parameters. Individual reporting as well as support in setting up emergency plans, for example, is also offered as well as virtual meetings. Let us summarize what we've seen so far by looking into the future. The current status, we are in the year 2023, is that Argos is used to perform cut exposure analysis, as we can see here. In 2024, we will release an extensive update of Argos, including further hazard maps such as hail, landslides, and snow loads. This new version will be rolled out to the market and thus made available for HDI clients. In 2025, we will implement climate risk analysis to provide a fully automated approach to our users. We will consider three emission scenarios for different return periods and provide data until the year 2100. One can say to account for changing climate patterns, um, we look into the future. But the question is, how does this work? Um, as I said, we will consider three scenarios being different SSPs, so-called shared socioeconomic pathways. These pathways are climate change scenarios of projected socioeconomic global changes up to 2100. These were defined in the IPCC report in 2021. In simple words, um, they describe and consider the emission of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. SSP 8.5, for example, at the left, the business as usual scenario assumes that there will be no reduction of emissions at all. Even in contrast, emissions will rise throughout the 21st century. Best case is SSP 2.6 on the right, which means it is assumed emissions will be, <clears throat> will be cut to an amount which is in line with the Paris Agreement to achieve a maximum increase in global temperature of 1.5 degrees Celsius. And in the upper part, as an example, you can see a different rating. They are provided for different scenarios and errors. We will come to this in a second. But the assumption, the simple assumption is, the more greenhouse gases are emitted into the atmosphere, the higher the exposure in the future. SSP 8.5 means highest emissions. SSP 2.6, as I said, means lowest emissions. However, this is a bit too simple, as there are a lot of parameters to be considered, and development of exposures is different for different perils and for different areas in the world. These information are summarized on hundreds and hundreds and thousands of pages within the IPCC report. So the question is, how can we know um, how the risks 
change over time. Well, it's not only us, <laughs> it's the corporation. We have a partner called Mitiga Solutions, and Mitiga invested a lot of time and expertise into research and data validation. So in short words, Mitiga delivers the data, which is finally used by us in order to determine the exposure over time for our clients. And what we do with the data, however, not in a fully automated approach, this is to come in 2025, is to determine the impact of climate change for different perils and scenarios. For example, let's assume we look at a client with 300 locations all over the world. We provide so-called management overviews regarding the pathways up to the year 2100. In this case, the overall ranking for all 300 locations is B on a scale from A to F, where F is the worst. But uh, maybe it's a good idea to look at an example. Um, look at this. For example, for the perils of drought, flooding, heat stress, precipitation, wildfire, and wind. Information about the development of the risk over time is given for the 300 locations by providing scores for each of the years until the year 2100. The data can be analyzed in five-year increments. However, here the years 2030, 2050, and 2100 are given as examples. Looking at droughts, for example, it comes clear that the rating of the client will worsen from B to D in 2100. Remember, F is the worst possible rating. And we can even dive deeper. Um, <clears throat> let us provide more detailed information. Information about the number of locations at risk from the respective peril are given. Again, compared to different points in time. In this case, let us look at the 230 and 2100. Looking at drought again, in the year 230, 180 locations of 300 are rated A and 90 are rated B. This is different in the year 2100, as the risk of drought increases under the business as usual scenario, SSP 8.5. Um, there's a shift of location towards worse scores over time. The same is performed for other periods of flooding and heat stress. And also precipitation, wildfire and wind. And you will realize for some parrots, the development is stronger than for others. It is thus easy to identify most important parrots for the whole portfolio of the 300 locations. But what about information for single locations? It is also possible to provide information for single locations, mm, scores per scenario and per parrot at site level, easily identify which parrot is driving the overall rating. Assuming the business as usual scenario, again, this location has to deal with heat stress and wind risk. Again, let me mention that um, we can also con consider the other two scenarios that I'm just referring here to the business usual scenario. Okay, even more detailed. For each single location, it is possible to say, how will the peril here, consecutive dry days, develop over time and what is the impact on the rating? This can be carried out for different return periods and all climate, all three climate scenarios from SSP 8.5 to 2.6. It allows to identify highest exposure for now and in the future. Another example is precipitation. Here it shows the 20 year return period. And the question is how many millimeters of precipitation of rain falls? How does it change over time? What does it mean for the customer and how can they can the customer protect themselves himself? You can only prepare if you know what needs to be expected. Um, but this is not only important information for our client, this is also important information for us as it allows <clears throat> as it allows us to define which measures are necessary and at what point in the future they should be implemented. Um, so maybe there's no need to implement them now or next year, but maybe in 230, 235, whatever. This leads to two things, risk appropriate assessment of the site and security for our customers. So my final summary, HDI consulting, a risk consulting performs cut exposure analysis for geophysical, meteorological, hydrological, and climatological patterns to identify the current exposure. Right? Climate risk analysis for temperature, 
wind, water-related, and solid mass-related climate risks identify the exposure in the future. Um, both kinds of analysis will be carried out automatically in Argos from 2025 on. To round the whole thing, and I think, Marco, you already mentioned that, we do climate risk regulatory reporting to support clients in fulfilling all the regulatory requirements which are to come soon, be it EU taxonomy, CZD reporting, and whatever, right? And uh, yeah, although the summary may look a bit simple or, or short, it contains quite a lot of information and offers, so to say, a one-stop shop for the assessment of natural perils. We as HDI have an interest in covering the space now and the future. All right, um, all I can say now is thanks for listening. And in, in case any questions appear, or if you would like to dive a bit deeper, feel free to reach out to us. It's not just me, but our team, which has a mail address. Um, you can read it, HRC, Natural Hazard at HDI Global. Um, we are happy to assist, we're happy to discuss. And uh, yeah, feel free and uh, thanks again. And of course, Mark, I'm not sure if there are any questions Right there now, are or questions, of they course, are. and uh, okay. of course, my, my role as a moderator is, uh, of course, very easy today. I mean, uh, German punctuality is always on top. Uh, <laughs> there is uh, still some uh, some time, uh, so we are, uh, you know, ahead of schedule. So I I can uh, uh, take one of the question coming from the audience. Uh, if you agree, Matthias, for you. Uh, what yeah, is okay. the specific value proposition of Argos if we compare Argos with the usual tools uh, available from the reinsurer ma reinsurance market? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, um, the, the value proposition for me is quite clear, right? Um, it's true. We do a lot of things our competitors, so to say, do also. Um, for me, it's, it's pretty... Um, unique to have the one-stop shop, so to say, um, the whole assessment from the now into the future um, from next year or from 2025 on. I think that is quite unique and that is a real value proposition to be able to automatically identify uh, where is my exposure and where do I have to deal with it, especially in terms of the regulatory requirements. Okay. That so, would be yes. my answer. Ah uh, yeah yeah uh, I, I do agree I mean it's it's uh, uh, it's crystal clear that uh, the uh, enhancement uh, considering having a, a, a snapshot considering gradually all uh, all the weather re related event uh, and uh, giving uh, you know using uh, the SSP scenarios uh, to have uh, you know a protection in the future about what will happen in terms of physical risks affecting uh, mm -hmm. you know uh, all the uh, assets of one of your clients is is the real difference between what is uh, uh, publicly available from the insurance market and, and your value proposition i i do believe good uh, right, yeah. perhaps uh, if uh, fabrizio agrees since we have still a uh, a couple of minutes. One, one, uh, one question more technical coming from uh, from me exactly. So uh, when it comes to earthquake, uh, of course we always have our antennas on uh, in Italy. So you say that uh, in uh, in Argos you have uh, uh, when when it comes to earthquake mapping uh, both uh, MMI, so Mercalli modified intensity scale and you also have the uh, peak ground acceleration uh, scale so you have both which is good because of course uh, in uh, in italy uh, the uh, the legislation is based on peak ground acceleration but uh, my my right. uh, question uh, what is the average recurring interval that you take into consideration in in uh, in both mm -hmm. scales so both using the MMI scale and uh, and using the peak ground mm -hmm. acceleration. It's uh, thank you very much for that question. It's nice that you mentioned it because I think I forgot to say something. <laughs> um, no. So first of all, um, first of all, the return period we refer to is the 475 year return period. So once in 475 years event. Um, and um, yeah, I have to say um, you're right. Uh, we do 
refer to the Mercalli intensity and the peak ground acceleration. Um, we do this for the um, footprints I showed you. For the hazard map, um, we currently refer to the modified Mercalli intensity. And as I said, there will be a big update for Argos next year. And the new hazard map for earthquakes then has both. It has the modified Mercalli intensity and the peak ground acceleration um, to easily yeah, assess the risk, so to say. So it's true, we have both, um, <laughs> but uh, we, we will have both from next year on to the same for all available. Okay, doc. Uh, yeah, there are uh, other questions are coming. I don't know if I will. I will not be able to to present uh, uh, all of uh, the question coming for for sure. Um, mm -hmm. uh, one question uh, well, is: for me? Uh, Are climate risks taken from the same source as the NatCat risks? Uh, uh, that means. Uh, uh, cut risk, the American company uh, you have uh, you have mentioned. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, this depends. So for all the climate risks, uh, let me let me call it for looking into the future. Um, we have the cooperation with Mitica Solutions, and uh, for the so to say current cut exposure, we have different sources. So for example, as I said, for the flood risk, um, we refer to to cut risk. Um, to yeah to get the data the data um, as they provide both um, the the exposure from river flood and precipitation flood so to say for example and for the other maps um, we use data from yeah, let me call it the big official um, institutes institution institutes for example um, the NOAA in the US for example or Japanese Meteorological Agency or so the JMA um, so this is more or less freely available data on the internet, um, and we take this data, validate it, and uh, then build the hazard maps for this. So the, the, the short answer is we do have several sources for climate risk is Mitiga, um, and for the rest it is different diverse sources. So to say. Okay. Vielen Dank, uh, Matthias. I think uh, uh, we have uh, used all the time. There is one question which I think would be great to introduce the presentation of uh, of my friend Fabrizio. That is, uh, how can okay. you use Argos also not only to categorize climate risk, but also to try to drive loss prevention in the climate risk? I'm sure that you will talk okay. about this, uh, Fabrizio, in your presentation. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, let me let me say thank you again. And I mean, in case any questions come up, it's no problem to to clarify at a later point. Yeah, I'll be available. Okay, but Fabrizio, the stage is yours, I think. Thanks. Yes, of course. Thanks very much, Matthias, once again. Thanks, Matthias. Uh, thanks, so. Uh, good morning, everybody. And uh, just... Launching the presentation. Can you hear me now? Okay. Perfect. So, um, there are problems, sorry, a bit. Okay. No. It seems I'm connected now. Can you see the, I suppose that you can see uh, the screen? Confirmation, yes, confirmed. So, this presentation um, is... Uh, aims to show you how natural uh, events can generate uh, huge losses and um, comparing these losses also with uh, consequences, so for example, impacting on supply chains uh, in this uh, globalized world. Uh, something that happens uh, somewhere can impact worldwide. And uh, then we will move in uh, chapter two to a very brief uh, um, uh, glance to natural hazards, especially focusing on this year and this year trends. 
uh, and then we will move on the chapter three. That's exactly uh, the question uh, uh, you asked me, uh, Marco. We will move from uh, Matthias presentation uh, aiming to a globalized approach, uh, aimed to a territorial classification of risks, uh, I can say statistical approach, and uh, we will move to how can we support our insurer clients in uh, adopting, uh, analyzing, adopting the, the risk measures and uh, adopting the measure of protection improvements, and uh, then uh, we can act as a partner for our insurer. Um, just move as this 30 minutes presentation uh, uh, as a very brief time. Uh, we are not able to enter into details. And so the approach is just to introduce you to uh, an overall overview and uh, like an appetizer of what we can do. Um, maybe there will be uh, next chances of uh, going into deep, into uh, depth for uh, any detailed uh, treatment. Uh, just start with uh, chapter one, with the first slide, uh, just highlighting uh, the two emerging risks, natural hazards and uh, supply chain. Uh, yearly, uh, the publishers, uh, organiz economic organization, insurers, reinsurers, everyone tries to um, uh, make some uh, investigation and polls, uh, service of opinions, uh, on managers, uh, owners, uh, entrepreneurs, and uh, the risk perception is changing along the latest years. And nowadays, uh, the, roughly the, 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 the highest uh, uh, threats are perceived as a cyber, uh, technological, uh, uh, in, uh, the, the news, uh, uh, the, the technological threats, uh, and on the same level, there are the, the climate change and the natural hazards. Um, after uh, geopolitical instabilities, economical inflation and so on, we have also another step with the supply chain and business interruption. Of course, uh, probably uh, uh, the last two years, shortage uh, and of uh, steel, aluminium, the delays in uh, supplying uh, machineries, the difficulties in shipping something from the Far East to the West, all these matters increase the, the supply chain perception of the hazards. But these are two risks. And if we move from our first statement to the second, we can see that uh, the globalized uh, organization is uh, a cause of our vulnerabilities to natural losses. Um, if um, we uh, have climate change deeply impacting on natural cover losses, we can also state that there's also a part that is impacted not by climate change, but by our vulnerabilities, our uh, microeconomic uh, organization that is impacted by any disruption, so that um, process flows um, or uh, logistic activities, uh, global fragilities, uh, and so on, are all elements of our vulnerabilities. And uh, this axiom, we are not depending only by climate change. Yes, climate change are very, very important, but we are also depending on our vulnerability is, uh, uh, can be proved by a comparison, for example, between the economical costs and the deaths generated by earthquakes. Earthquakes like, for example, volcanoes, tsunami are not depending on climate change, of course. And uh, if we, for example, just give a glance to these statistics, the statistics are uh, uh, supplied by the KIT, the Carson Institute of Technology, and uh, they are examining the last 120 years. And uh, if you uh, just give a look at the red histograms, uh, the red ones are related to um, earthquakes, the blue one to floods, you can see that the red dotted line is showing a huge increase in economical costs, also for a totally not dependent uh, natural hazard from climate change. Um, just moving to the next slides, for example, what can happen if uh, an earthquake hits uh, 
a, a, a very um, powerful earthquake. It hits the Taiwan Island. Uh, just think the shortage on semiconductors impacting uh, automotive, electronics, industries, uh, trains, uh, of aerospace, and so on. And uh, also in China, there's um, uh, a country uh, normally hit by uh, several um, natural hazards. For example, I glanced at uh, a, uh, a statistic that told us that in 2016, um, the impact of the natural hazards, and it was not the worst year, resulted in uh, 72 billion dollars direct and 50 indirect. This means over one percent point of the China GDP. Uh, of course, uh, these impacts on uh, uh, supply chain happens also because natural hazards are capable of hitting large areas, especially when uh, they have uh, they are powerful. So uh, a Japan uh, problem, a Far East problem, can be uh, can spread worldwide. Um, closing this first part of the presentation, we can uh, summarize everything, saying that nowadays material property damages, supply chain, and major hazards are roughly similar pillars in the insurance loss in the insured losses. And uh, also for corporates, uh, they represent similar threats and uh, that not only climate change are increasing and impacting on natural hazard losses, but also our vulnerability to any imbalance. Just move uh, now to the second uh, chapter that uh, uh, opens to uh, look on the trends of natural hazard losses. And I don't want to enter too much in these figures. Our Matthias already introduced to you, and additionally, uh, reinsurers, all economical associations are providing a lot of these information. Here you have uh, a EEA Environmental Agency, European Environmental Agency uh, statistic, but I just want to move you to, uh, to see some uh, statistics that I gather for you as regards this first part of the year, the current year, 2023. Um, so in this uh, statistics, uh, the hurricane Otis uh, impacting Mexico and the Morocco earthquake are not included. Um, in this first six months of this year, 110 billion dollars uh, econo economically impacted the world, the world. Only, or 43 billions were insured, but only 6 billions were insured on 59 billion dollars uh, hitting the European countries. The European countries have been uh, impacted especially by the Turkish uh, earthquake. Uh, the Turkey earthquake alone means uh, 40 uh, billion dollars. The, the interesting thing is to note how, while in US we have a transfer, a risk transfer, approximately between 30, 40 percent to insurers uh, of the economical losses suffered from natural events. In Europe, we have from 10 to 15 percent. In Italy, we, as Marco in, uh, told, introducing us, uh, 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 around 10 billion dollars damages from, uh, generated by the Emilia-Romagna floods and uh, the Northeast floods. Uh, only one billion was insured, and um, so we are. Uh, we have to focus on this problem and maybe uh, make some consideration also waiting uh, the governmental decisions uh, uh, of our legge di bilancio that is uh, trying to set a mandatory uh, cover, insurance cover, uh, as regards uh, the natural hazards. Um, we can discuss about the mandatory laws because um, uh, the Turkey government uh, applied a natural hazards mandatory cover that only 5 million 
billion dollars uh, were insured out of the, the 40 suffered the economical loss uh, as a consequence of the earthquake. Now, um, just move without entering too much in these details, just move to the main chapter of this presentation that is what can do we as HDI Global and HDI Risk Consulting to uh, act as a partner for our insurer. And uh, I tried to list all the things we can do, for example. And uh, these uh, are the identification of uh, natural hazards, their quantification. Uh, we can accept the transfer after the evaluation of uh, the risks. And uh, from a risk consulting property assets, so we can do also uh, the quantification and uh, the identification of the risk and the risk reduction by means of our risk improvement measures or recommendations. So let's use this, this word, recommendation. Iterative control of the risk improvement and measures, and especially focusing on uh, uh, seismic impacts, as Mark already mentioned. We can do something. We can do uh, and apply some measures trying to strengthen our resilience to uh, the natural uh, impacts. Just go to the next slide and um, just see, for example, uh, an earthquake, a seismic uh, risk approach. Uh, you have the formula of the seismic risk calculation. and. Um, Starting from a zonization, geopod zonization of the risk on a based on a probabilistic risk uh, seismic uh, hazard analysis. As Matthias already told you, uh, we have uh, uh, the worldwide already classified in uh, the probabilistic sorry, risks, uh, also the insured sums, and then what we can do as risk consulting a survey on the site, an examination of the site risks an examination of the vulnerabilities to the natural hazards, and then we can modify the seismic risk acting on the V parameter. Of course, we can't move the plant, uh, moving it in a not hazardous zone. We can't also uh, lower the economical, the insurance sums and the economic aspects, but we can do something to improve the resilience of the site of the plants to an action of the from the regional hazards. For example, just move to our earthquake craters. Uh, we can uh, examine the soil, the foundation, the buildings, the frames, uh, a lot of uh, parameters that are entering um, in uh, this global uh, evaluation of the site. And um, for example, so just start from one question, Marco, that uh, came from you. Uh, in Italy, we have a very, very detailed and very good provider of information as regards earthquakes. INGD, uh, for me, is one of the best, for sure. And um, I prefer to the USGS also having worked with them, both them uh, in comparison also. And uh, the INGD provides, uh, for example, for each municipality, shares the, um, the, the, the territory in a five uh, square kilometer, kilometers, as you can see from uh, this map, and you can see the Ravenna municipality, and you can see that I can move from uh, less hazardous areas to more hazardous areas. We are moving from 0.1 to 0.2, 0.25 G uh, risks. So, sorry, I don't want to enter too much in technical details, but this is only to say you that INGV is providing you everything also in relationship to the return time we select. Normally we use 475. Then we will move to the plans we are assessing. So first, a glance to the shape of facilities, of plants, uh, the layout, the shape factors, for example, I don't want to see the trampoline shape, uh, means the cantilever, but no, watch out the buildings, one in, the, in adjacency to the other, because of the hammering of them. Uh, just choose the symmetric 
and not the asymmetric ways and the horizontality instead of verticality move to the soil assessment to slabs and piles foundations and assess them watch out the liquefied soils there are they are not happening only in japan and china um, and then one of the hazards that mostly hit during uh, the Emilia earthquake we suffered in uh, 2012. Um, isostatic frames, isostatic means that they have a slipping grade, um, were typical of uh, these buildings in Emilia because uh, Emilia uh, had a great in industrial development in uh, the 70s, 80s, uh, 70s and 80s. This means that what you can do to erect buildings in a very fast way. Just use pre-stressed, pre precast, reinforced concrete. And this was very easy in a region that was not obliged, mandatorily obliged to put and calculate the structures in hyperstatic uh, frames. And that's why a lot of warehouses, logistic areas and so on, slipped down and collapsed. Um, we can do uh, several things, for example, bracings. We can suggest joints, we can suggest stiffeners. Uh, and this means what we can do as a recommendation for our clients. Then, are we focusing on your buildings? No, not at all, because a, a lot of uh, hazards can arrive to plants of dealing with hazmats, especially we can focus on uh, chemical and petrochemical plants. We have to watch out to the bracings and the clamps for, for example, our pipelines, for our uh, trays, for our um, flammables and so on. And also we can put uh, attention on our fire protections. Uh, fire protections can be very stressed by uh, earthquakes and uh, we can also provide you project reviews on sprinkler systems if they comply also on fire protection if they comply to the standards um, i wish to show you for example only a video a very a few seconds pause on this video Oh, we tested it before. Okay. And uh, just to show you, how can earthquakes stress Sorry for the volume rising. This is only to, uh, to show you how can um, earthquake stress our uh, how can stress our um, pipelines of sprinklers um, and uh, furthermore what about uh, for example uh, power plants or maybe semiconductor factors that are collecting uh, huge values uh, in uh, small areas or uh, dumps for example um, a special outlook we can uh, put on uh, service of plants because they can uh, get catastrophic uh, uh, dis disasters uh, following an earthquake um, we are already experienced uh, some huge damages uh, in the 2011 uh, earthquake in japan and um, at the nuclear power station and uh, no one talked about this blemy this also uh, this is the last video i will show you uh, this blemy was incredible um, it is a blemy that i will show in this video that happens while there is a live talking in a tv uh, live show news and just see uh, the comment of uh, the speaker when the blevy starts. Uh, 
this is a, a petrochemical factory and you can see the spheres of the LPG. And now there is the Blevy. And the speaker stops. Um, okay, what happened uh, at the Inchiara refinery? A blevy means a fireball of 500 meters in the sky. Uh, soil totally melted, uh, paved the roads, uh, and uh, it was uh, only a simple uh, Murphy law consequence of a collapsing sphere that uh, with a domino approach destroyed everything. But it is not a matter of only Ichiara. Uh, in, uh, during the Izmit earthquake, a refinery suffered the collapse of their uh, water supply pipeline. And after a week of firefighting aircrafts uh, flying and discharging water over the refinery, the fire was stopped. Also, always in the 2011 earthquake in Japan, the boil overs of the Niigata factory. But not only, not only, <clears throat> sorry, not only earthquakes, but also floods can impact uh, um, the, uh, the, the, the chemical factory. Uh, ISPRA, for example, provided us a very interesting maps um, related to how many services or plants we have in Italy and how can we suffer with return times events from natural hazards. And um, the Arkema disaster in 2017 happened in Texas. And it was caused by, indirect caused by a flood uh, caused by Harvey uh, Hurricane. Uh, it was a huge disaster, not only for uh, the totally destroying uh, uh, events um, of this factory, but also for uh, the great polluting uh, consequences uh, on the area. What can we provide, therefore? for our insured clients and not cut risk analysis and to provide, we can provide also risk improvement measures. As we talked about earthquake, too much, just move to floods and just see uh, a sample of a risk measure we suggested as our recommendation for a client of ours. Um, the client um, is operating a site that is uh, located in the, um, Floodable area. We examined it uh, as Matthias already showed you, uh, starting from a um, geocoding uh, and different return times um, vulnerability of the site. Then we examined the soil and with a site survey, we examined in, de in details all the potentiality, all the potential entrance, also from sewage, from underground channels. We uh, suggested gateways, valves, and so on to uh, generate an isolation of the area. So we suggested uh, also an inventory of uh, the main critical machinery just to rise it up, rise them up, and uh, put them uh, in uh, positions that are not hit by uh, the water haze as estimated by the return times. And also, we prepared something as regards, we modified the emergency shutdown. The service directive, without entering in these details, the service directive, the um, directive three, mandatorily ask uh, the companies to prepare a risk analysis based on natural hazards. So we can do also this, assess what is done in the, the emergency shutdown plan and then give suggestions. Um, new technologies, only one slide related to new technologies, quick balls. So, uh, used to be a startup uh, attempt years ago in uh, Köln, and uh, these quick balls are something that uh, can get uh, incredibly low vibration 
um, uh, the vibrations, uh, for example, generated by um, earthquakes and also by any other uh, any other uh, matter of uh, uh, of a stress. And in this way, they can um, they can provide information as regards one the vulnerability of uh, the assets, two they can predict the arrival of an earthquake, and uh, we are just studying if we can use them uh, to study dams, for example. Hydropower plants can be, uh, uh, can be, our studies can be supported highly by cables. And so we can uh, go into how technologies, IoT can help us in our climate change. But as also Matthias spoke uh, before, and I leave to Glenn some news about this. And then just move to the fourth section, that is the closing section. Just briefly summarize what we have seen during this presentation. We started from emergency risks, emergency uh, natural hazard, not emergency risk, but the losses are emergency. Emerging as the supply chain. Then we examined how the increase of the losses of natural hazards uh, are related to climate change, but also to our vulnerabilities, and uh, introduce what we can do as HDR is consulting to provide to our insurance clients uh, assessment to be partners in managing their risks and provide them recommendations to try to improve their resilience uh, against these dramatically rising uh, events. Uh, we examined also some incredible losses like the ones uh, up at, the, at the petrochemical plants or uh, dams and so on. And uh, I drove your attention to some recommendations. Oh, now, this is only an appetizer, as I told you. Uh, what we can do, leaving our door open to any questions, uh, we can further go into details as regards technical discussions. Uh, insurance and underwriting uh, topics as regards natural hazards. Uh, business interruption supply chain. Supply chain is strictly connected to natural hazards. Uh, infrastructures. I had a lot of uh, works in the past with uh, infrastructures and the uh, construction line of business in the insurance uh, uh, business. Climate change, as also Glenn will spend some words, I suppose, on. In new technologies and this is digitalization. Um, in conclusion, this webinar is only a general introduction, an appetizer, and we will stay here for any questions for you and uh, any support for further uh, requests, explanations, and so on. And uh, I will uh, also wish to uh, thank uh, the ANRA support and uh, you all for uh, so for having listened to this presentation and I close here my presentation. Marco, Thank you very much. Please. Thank you very much Fabrizio. Uh, yeah, so far uh, no questions from the audience but uh, I have for sure some <laughs> myself. Um, uh, the first one is uh, regarding uh, um, the uh, scenarios of uh, you know uh, clients that uh, do fulfill the risk uh, reduction recommendation that you uh, submit to them uh, if they are able to reduce the normal loss expectancy uh, so my question is in case of uh, of uh, of, uh, of a proactive client that is uh, actually fulfilling uh, uh, all the loss prevention measures that are recommended by by HDI engineers, meaning uh, of course uh, earthquake bracing for for sprinkler systems or safety shut off valves for methane gas or in case of earthquake or uh, as you have mentioned, Fabrizio, the uh, barriers or flood emergency response plan. Uh, well, well, uh, well uh, tested, and so on. Are those measures uh, able to reduce uh, uh, normal loss expectancy? And to what extent 
uh, you can improve your uh, your risk evaluation. Okay, here I am. Um, yes, of course they can. Uh, for example, um, uh, just go to some slides I showed you. Uh, when you have a, a seismic vulnerability of uh, uh, just go back to the, the, the slide uh, with the pictures of the Emilia um, earthquake in 2012. Uh, if we have uh, had improved this connection between pillars and beams, putting them from isostatic to hyperstatic, uh, probably we, uh, we won't have uh, all these damages. For example, just after the Emilia earthquake, uh, all the engineers, uh, civil engineers, earthquake engineers, what did? Uh, installed bracings and uh, um, angular plates to fix the connections, pillars, beams. So just imagine how many buildings have not collapsed with these supports. Or maybe just go to the Arkema flood I showed you. Um, the CBS, these are the huge American organization investigating on chemical, uh, uh, chemical incidents and uh, supporting ILEAS. Um, CBS made some investigation and noted, for example, uh, weakness points in uh, the emergency shutdown plan, the mistakes in the evaluation of the, uh, of the um, flood hazards, probably, uh, maybe, um, uh, the probabilistic uh, the probabilistic maps that Matthias showed you um, can be uh, a recommendation for the client saying watch out that uh, this is not a 500 return time event zone this is a hundred uh, return time um, for example when I approach the, the recommended the item on flood hazards that I showed you in the map, uh, blocking all the entrance to my client site. I compared our Argos, the ISPRA, IRP, and also the Basin Authority, and also the study that the company uh, put in charge from a consultant. All together, and I saw that they were rather compliant altogether, and then I needed to approach it. So, one, fix the right return times to set the right protections. We can do it, Marco. Okay, thanks a lot. Then, uh, yeah, it's uh, another question less uh, less technical, but more uh, on the on the writing side, uh, perhaps for uh, for 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 Matthias. So, what is what is your uh, your uh, estimates regarding uh, you know the uh, reinsurance cost for for uh, for uh, an insurance player a global insurance player as HDI i mean do you see the reinsurance cost uh, becoming very very high and impacting the the cost of transfer for the next year so what is your uh, your feeling mm. good question marco <laughs> um <laughs> I have, I have to say um, I, I'm not familiar with buying the reinsurance uh, for HDI, so to say. But what I hear from my colleagues is exactly what you said. Yeah, costs are rising um, for years now, and, and I think it is it is expected that the costs will rise or the prices will rise for the next years as well as natural catastrophes play a more and more important role, right? And uh, of course, uh, losses. Um, finally leads to higher prices then. But as I said, yep. I'm not an expert in this matter, but uh, this is my yeah, indication, so to say. Perception, yeah, of course, as a, as a yeah, yeah, um, yeah, I didn't want to put you in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, no, in no, a bad position, fine. but I'm sure that, uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, that for, with, with the tool that you provide uh, for, for your work, to be able to underwrite properly uh, an industrial risk and even even uh, I would say petrochemical risk or or uh, you know very very high hazards like uh, uh, you know sites be uh, subject to Seveso directive 
uh, it's not only a tool that it enables you to properly underwrite the risk, but also to drive correct risk engineering, uh, uh, you know, recommendations and suggestions for the clients to be able, of course, to reduce the impact of uh, of the risk. Not only, I would say, I would underline, not only the structural risk, which normally scares a lot us, because if you really want to retrofit an existing site with pre-cast pre concrete mm -hmm. structure like the ones that uh, Fabrizio has shown, it's really yeah. huge money. But I mean, you can do a lot to reduce the non-structural risk. Uh, I mean, with with the which is, by the way, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, the the big part of the loss that you normally experiment in case of a quake. Uh, I mean, we have all seen, uh, you know, the domino effect on the racks in the in the Emilia Romagna uh, quake, and uh, we have seen a lot of fire following scenarios based on, you know, impaired. Uh, uh, fire protection, fixed fire protection system. So, I mean, I would give an optimistic, uh, you know, uh, suggestion to all all the audience to say it's it's not always, you know, fantastic and huge money you have to spend to uh, actually increase uh, increase the level of resilience when it comes to NATCAT. So it's it's. Uh, I mean, uh, I don't know if you agree in the in the, in my optimistic view. I mean. <laughs> This is uh, this is uh, a good uh, good takeaway, I, I believe, for for all all uh, the audience. May I add, Marco, a consideration of, um, after your words? Uh, first, the yes, uh, reinsurers are rising up. Uh, they are. The, this is the forecast. Uh, they are the, um, their costs, but also uh, what about the limits? And especially, just move to the insured clients. Um, of course, everyone of us know that perfectly knows that uh, one thing is the transfer to the insurer of uh, the risk of a corporate. Another thing is what about the corporate, the company, um, as regards all the risks that can't be insured and are not, they are not only deductibles. A lot of companies after one, two years after a catastrophe, a very impacting natural hazard loss, are suffering some, very few of them, but some are not regetting the previous economical trends. So this is a, a partnership, as I always used to say, uh, this is a partnership between someone, the insurer, that tries not only to get to the transfer of the risk, but also to participate in improving the resilience to the hazards with some recommendations and always our recommendations are based on a cost approach. And on the other side of the client that needs to protect its business, transferring a part of their risks. Thanks very much, Fabrizio. It's now time to introduce Glenn. So welcome, Glenn, uh, to to this panel. I mean, uh, Glenn Van Miel. I don't know if I pronounced it correctly or Van Miele. Uh, uh, maybe it's better. It's a member of the management board of HDI Risk Consulting. So uh, let's uh, let's give uh, Glenn the chance to drive some conclusion about uh, about this uh, seminar. Please, Glenn. Glenn. Perfect. Good morning. I hope you can all understand me. Um, yes. so I would say buongiorno a tutti uh, per i colleghi italiani. Guten Morgen an alle für die Deutschsprachen und uh, good morning for, for all the other ones. Um, it, it's a pleasure, uh, Marco, to, to be invited, first of all, by, by Anya to have this uh, training session uh, organized for you. Uh, I would also like to thank you personally for moderating uh, this, this presentation and also special thanks to Matthias and Fabrizio, longtime colleagues for me. Uh, I was listening to all the questions and I said, wow, they are responding to all the questions, so, so what's my added value here? Uh, but I would like to give so, some, some insights in HI risk consulting and also HGI Global because there were some insurance related questions. And then let me start by first saying that since a couple of weeks, HGI Global as an insurance company, we have introduced a new vision. And the new vision, uh, which is hopefully also familiar for some of our clients, is partner in transformation. And what does that mean? Um, we know that all our clients and all the industrial clients, they are in transformation in some way. Um, we have on from various sites, 
the transition or transformation into carbon neutral. Um, we have uh, windmills coming up. We have more and more investments in solar panels worldwide. We have hydrogen technology uh, affecting steel manufacturing plants. Uh, we have battery storage, but we also have, as we had in this presentation, uh, climate risks and climate change. And as Fabrizio already indicated, also the supply chain issues. Uh, so, so starting with this AGI Global Vision, being a partner in transformation, that means that AGI Global as an insurance company, we want to be there for clients. Um, and, and this wanting to be there also has a very big impact on HR risk consulting. And then in my role as, as one of the two board members of, of uh, HR as a risk consulting with more or less 180 colleagues in the 23 countries, we have two targets. First of all, we support clients by providing service excellence. Uh, and it's, it's what you heard from Matthias and from Fabrizio. We do the analysis on natural hazard, but we also look into the future. What comes up? What is, will be the impact on climate change? What will be the flood risk look like in 2050, in 2075, in 2100? Um, and on the other hand, we support our underwriting uh, in underwriting excellence. And then let me come back to the question that was posed by the audience. How does it look like from a reinsurance perspective on, on premiums? Um, premiums and price is just one part of the story. I think the bigger part and the bigger question is, will there be capacity for natural catast for catastrophes? Um, and I think there it comes, uh, and then I'm quoting there some colleagues or some brokers in the market, it's up to clients to bring their sites or to bring their insurance package as a sexy. And what I mean with that is uh, we, we want to have, as an insurance company, we, we want to have a good understanding. We, have, we want to have a good insights. And one could say, oh, California is dangerous because there's an earthquake risk in California. No, that's not correct. There is an earthquake risk for some locations in some parts of California. And, and this is exactly the point. The more precise we have data, the better we can do pricing, the better there will be a chance that there will be adequate capacity at the correct price. And, and this is where HR Risk Consulting plays its role towards clients to bring this transparency, to be a data-driven company, but also towards the insurance company, HR Global, to say, well, this is our portfolio that we have, this is how it looks like, this is now the exposure, and then it's up to HR uh, Global as an insurance company to come up with adequate capacity with adequate solutions. So that's what I wanted to add to that uh, to that question to that conversation. Very clear value proposition. I mean, excellence in underwriting, excellence in the in the in the support of uh, of your client. I mean, very very clear message uh, from from you, Glenn. Thanks very much. Uh, there is one question still. Even if I I'm seeing uh, that Angelica is as uh, shown as started to shown. The uh, you know the instructions to be followed for uh, accessing the the test that is uh, worth uh, you know uh, credits for the uh, uh, continuous uh, learning in the IBAS uh, uh, registro unico degli intermediari. Uh, so, but I think we still have a couple of minutes. Uh, there are a lot of questions. Uh, of course, we will we will send them to you. But it's um, of course a lot of people interested in Argos. So one question out of the many is: uh, Are there already plans about uh, uh, you know the, uh, what is the cost uh, for uh, accessing the tool when non-clients or external uh, wants to access it? Mm. Yeah, I can take that question. Um, right. It's a very good question. And um, <laughs> I have to ask for a bit more patience, uh, <laughs> so to say, right. we are currently discussing this. Um, as, as you can imagine, we have different people working on different topics. So, so we have the guys um, implementing all the technical stuff. We have the guys um, implementing the scientific uh, um, things and issues. And we have, of course, um, some guys, um, yeah, uh, planning and, and organizing the, the go-to-market strategy. And within the strategy, we are currently discussing um, yeah, what it will cost, and uh, there are different models, there are different ways to, um, yeah, to um, um, how can I say um, in, in English? Um, Glenn, maybe you can help me, so Bezahlwege, also um, Modelle, Bezahlmodelle. Can you help me out with that in English? 
I'm not sure if Marco. I'm afraid Glenn, please, please. I'm afraid Glenn is, uh, looks frozen. Okay, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, he's I'm frozen. Okay, okay. With the with the with the German. Oh, I, I see Glenn. It's yeah. it's. Uh... Yeah, that's... He's what, I, what I wanted to say. Okay. Um, so what I wanted to say is uh, there are different ways how to to build the clients. For, for the system, right? And we are currently discussing the best ways to say yeah? the most easiest way for our clients and, and so on. So the, start, the, the short answer is still in discussion and okay. um, I'm not able to say um, any price today. Okay, okay, great. But uh, still it's in the it's in the plan. It's in, in, in your thoughts about- uh, It is, of course. Of course, of course. Very well. So, uh, last but not least, I also want to thanks very to thank you very much for the for the high level of the presentation. Uh, so, big thank to you, Matthias, and to you, Fabrizio, and Glenn. Uh, thanks for for joining and uh, giving a, a very very clear value proposition of HDI Risk Consulting. So uh, thanks from our from uh, from our side, and I leave the word to Angelica to give in Italian. <laughs> I would say since it's just for our Italian colleagues, uh, the once again the instruction uh, for the Ruivas test. Thank you, Marco. Grazie a tutti. Ovviamente, congratulations, everybody. Il test è aperto, vedete proiettate le istruzioni, le avete comunque ricevute anche via mail, ve le ho scritte in chat, sono sempre le stesse. Eh, noi vi auguriamo buon Natale, Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to everybody. Thank you. Exactly. Merry Christmas. Bye bye. Same to you. Bye. Bye bye.